Okay, Hare Krishna. So we'll start with the Mangala Charm. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmei Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Manu Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamsha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindo Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, so just, just quickly before I start, if, for those who were there last time I gave the class, um, I mentioned that I wanted to uh, dedicate to the class um, to a particular devotee to the father of uh, some of you may know Rasik Rai Prabhu. Um, so sadly, since then he's he has passed away. Um, but I would still, you know, like to request if all the devotees, even if you don't know him, uh, please if you could just pray for the onward journey of Anil Ruparelia, the father of Rasik Rai Prabhu. And also, I've found out today that my my grandmother has been taken into hospital due to various health issues and she's been tested positive for COVID as well. So if you could also please pray for her as well. Thank you so much. Okay, so I will just share the presentation that I've got for today. Give me one second. So, as I said, we're, we're covering text 15 today. Okay, so Sanskrit verse, first of all. Yunjan nevam sadatmanam yogi niyatamana saha shantim nirvana paramam matsam stham adhikachyati. Translation and purple by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. The translation. Thus, practicing constant control of the body, mind, and activities, the mystic transcendentalist, his mind regulated, attains to the kingdom of God, or the abode of Krishna, by cessation of material existence. So he's talking about the kingdom of God and Shri Prabhupada has added in brackets the abode of Krishna. Because if we obviously go back to the Sanskrit, it, you know, Krishna is saying mat samstam, it's, it's mine, you know, it's, it's my place. Um, so that's why, you know, Shri Prabhupada has specifically added the abode of Krishna. It's just to clarify what we're actually talking about here when we're talking about kingdom of God. Shri Prabhupada wants to bring our attention specifically to the boat of Krishna, not just the whole spiritual world 
as a whole. Because obviously we, we have heard that the spiritual world contains, you know, limitless planets, Vaikuntha planets, but above all of those is, is the abode of Krishna himself, Goloka Vrindavan. So Shura Prabhupada just want us, wants us to focus on that. So we'll just go through, um, I've just split the various paragraphs of the purport, and I've also given some points uh, from Shura Prabhupada's lecture uh, where they relate to the points of the purport as well. So the first, the first thing that Shura Prabhupada says in the purport that, that basically here we're actually going to start um, hearing what is the actual ultimate goal of practicing yoga. So Shura Prabhupada says, yoga practice is not meant for attaining any kind of material facility. It is to enable the cessation of all material existence. One who seeks an improvement in health or aspires after material perfection is no yogi, according to Bhagavad Gita. So we're talking about cessation of material existence. So cessation just means stopping it, bringing it to an end. So Sri Prabhupada explains a bit more about this uh, in the lecture, because if we go back to the verse, he's talking about nirvana. So then Sri Prabhupada is explaining in the lecture, what does nirvana mean? So maybe could I ask maybe for one volunteer just to read this small paragraph? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I can read. Yes, please. Thank you, Mother. Uh, nirvana means finished, finished. That is called nirvana. That means materialistic activity is finished. No more. That is called nirvana. And unless you finish this nonsense activities, there is no question of peace. Okay, thank you, Mataji. So, yeah, so here Sri Prabhupada is saying um, that one of the yeah, basically saying that one of the results of giving up these materialistic activities is that we can actually attain peace. So if we're not trying to give up those activities, then as he says here, there is no question of peace. So that's pretty, it's pretty straight, straightforward there. But um, I'll just add a bit more uh, from the lecture. So yeah, maybe you could have another, another person to read this paragraph, please. I could read it. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, now that President Mr. Kennedy, he was a very rich man. He wanted to be president and he spent money like anything. He became president. He had a nice family, wife, children. Presidentship finished within a second. Similarly, everyone is trying in the material world to capture something which is non-permanent. But I am spirit soul permanent. So these rascals they do, they do not come to sense that I am permanent. Why I am after non-permanent? Hare Krishna. Krishna. Thank you, Chetna Mataji. Okay, so now Sri Prabhupada in the lecture is trying to, well, he's starting to explain what, it, what does he mean about this, this lack of peace? Why is it that if we're focusing on material, materialistic activities, then why is it that we, we can't get peace? So the first point is that because as Sri Prabhupada says here, ultimately our nature is, is to be permanent. As a spirit soul, we are eternal, as we've heard many times, Satchidananda. You know, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. That is our, that is our nature. So then if we are always chasing after non-permanent things, then obviously it makes sense that non-permanent things cannot satisfy a, a permanent being, a permanent living entity. But then Sri Prabhupada is saying that still we don't generally, those of us in the material world, we never come to the point where thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I'm permanent. Why am I after non-permanent? You know, you can see, you can see very clearly uh, that the vast majority of people don't, you know, they don't come to that conclusion. Or well, they haven't, they haven't come to that conclusion yet, you know, in their journey. And then, so now Sri Prabhupada is explaining more about this point. So is there another another person to read this paragraph, please? Can I read Prabhuji? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. If you are always full of anxieties, where there is question of peace, I go in the street, I see beaver of dog. They are living in a very nice house, but full of anxieties. 
Somebody may not come, let there be dog. You see, bear of dog, no trespasses. That means although living in a nice cottage, very nice, but full of anxieties. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you so much. Okay, so Sri Prabhupada is now explaining why, um, why that lack of peace is there, because basically, you know, if, if we are permanent and we're chasing after these non-permanent things, then because they're non-permanent, we're always worrying that eventually, you know, we're going to lose them or it's going to disappear or it's going to go or it's going to end. So for that reason, even though we get all these things that we're chasing after, even when we have them, we can't be at peace because then we're in a, we're full of anxiety, as Sri Prabhupada says. So for example, um, he gives this example in a few different lectures, actually. Um, but basically he's saying that they've got their nice house, you know, their nice amenities, you know, all their money, whatever they have. Um, but now that they have it, they're just scared that they're going to lose it or they're scared that somebody's going to come um, and try and take it from them. So therefore, he's saying that therefore they get a dog, you know, and then now they're saying, you know, to those who are thinking of coming to steal from them or take, take, what, take what belongs to them, then they're saying, beware, there's a dog here. So, so that's like a further... A further anxiety that you've got you you full of so much anxiety how how do i get this how do i get this you make a whole plan in your mind how i'm going to get this so once you get it how do i keep it how do i keep it how do i keep it um and then how do i protect it from others so you know we can see um yeah someone sent me a question asking whether this refers to duality so yeah it's kind of yeah pointing out the dualities in this world so okay anyway there'll be there'll be more about this later um, okay so going back to the purple the next thing Sri Prabhupada says he says nor does cessation of material existence entail one's entering into the void which is only a myth there is no void anywhere within the creation of the Lord Rather, the cessation of material existence enables one to enter into the spiritual sky, the abode of the Lord. So when we, you know, when we hear, he's talking about cessation of material existence or stopping the existence, but it doesn't mean, you know, reducing our life to zero, making our life, you know, void. As, you know, we see in some philosophies, you know, for example, certain Buddhist philosophies and things like that. Um, where the aim is just to make everything zero, make everything null and void. So Sri Prabhupada is hinting that, you know, that doesn't exist. Um, this, this voidness, you know, it doesn't exist in the spiritual world. The spiritual world is full of varieties, but even not just in the spiritual world, but anywhere he's saying, wherever you look, even in the material world, there's no void. You know, there's no nothingness. So, and it's kind of, hinting um, about those who, who follow um, an impersonalistic philosophy where they're aiming to, you know, to merge into the Brahma Jyoti, merge into the effulgence of the Lord and reduce themselves to, to zero. But Sri Prabhupada is hinting here that that's not possible, that wherever we go, there's no void. And then in the lecture, so, so we just we just heard um, that it enables to it enables us to enter into the spiritual sky. So then, how do we find out about the spiritual sky? So Sri Prabhupada says, if you want to learn about the spiritual sky in God's kingdom, then you have to simply hear from the authority. There is no question of experimental knowledge; simply hearing. So this is another point that obviously here in the material world, most people vast majority of people, they want to see things with their own eyes. They want to ex experiment um, themselves and find it out for themselves. But here it's saying that, that there's no question of that when it comes to the spiritual, spiritual world, the spiritual kingdom, because obviously as conditioned souls, we don't have any knowledge of it or we don't remember anything about it. So the only way we can find out about it is to hear from an authority, is to hear about those who actually already know about it. So that's why he's saying 
you have to hear about it. And we always hear so much everywhere about the importance of hearing. So then, so then Sri Prabhupada goes on to give some, some description from the authority you know, of Krishna himself, the authority of the Bhagavad Gita, the authorized scriptures. So he's saying the abode of the Lord is also clearly described in the Bhagavad Gita as that place where there is no need of sun, moon, or electricity. All the planets in the spiritual kingdom are self-illuminating, like the sun in the material sky. The kingdom of God is everywhere, but the spiritual sky and the planets thereof are called Paramdham, or superior abodes. And so there's a nice point from the Bhagavad Gita about not needing the illumination. You know, the spiritual planets, they, they don't require any illumination from the sun, moon, or electricity. And actually, there's almost an uh, identical verse in the Bible as well, saying that in, in the kingdom of God, there's no need of illumination from the sun or the moon. So basically, he's saying that they're self-illuminating. You know, these are like the sun, they're giving off light themselves. This is referring to all the Vaikuntha planets in the spiritual world, and obviously also Goloka Vrindavan. But then he's saying that actually the kingdom of God is everywhere. So, because, you know, there's anything that exists, obviously it comes under the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of Krishna. So that includes the material world and the spiritual world. Because ultimately it all comes from Krishna. He's the source of it all. And, you know, he is the... Um, he is the master, he is the lord of it all. But then it's still making a distinction between the spiritual world and the material world by, by describing the spiritual world as paramdham, you know, the, the highest, the most superior abode. And okay, so the next point. Um, actually, sorry, maybe maybe can you know, again have someone to read this paragraph as well. Thank you. Any volunteers? Can I read Prabhuji? Yes, please, Prabhu. Thank you. <clears throat> Hare Krishna. A consummate yogi who is perfect in understanding Lord Krishna, as is clearly stated here by the Lord Himself, can attain real peace and can ultimately reach his supreme abode, Krishna Loka, known as Golok Vrindavan. In the Brahma Samhita 537, it is clearly stated Goloka Eva. Naivasti Akilatma Bhutaha. The Lord, although residing always in his abode called Goloka, is the all pervading Brahman and the localized Paramatma as well by dint of his superior spiritual energies. Thank you, Prabhupada. Okay, so now it's now Sri Prabhupada is explaining that. Because um, he mentioned at the beginning that we're going to be hearing about the ultimate goal of yoga. So he's saying that one who is, one who is consummate in yoga, one who is uh, well-versed in yoga, um, they have perfect understanding of Krishna. Because, you know, they know that's, that's the goal, ultimately, the goal of all yoga is to understand Krishna, to know Krishna. So Sri Prabhupada is saying only that person can actually attain real peace. So, you know, we heard a lot earlier about peace and how, you know, if we have all those material desires, we're focusing on so many material desires, um, we, just, we just become limitless. You know, we have so many desires. So those who manage to give up all those material desires and instead develop, you know, spiritual desires, then they can actually attain real peace. And then we, we can you know, reach the supreme abode, as we mentioned before, Goloka Vrindavan. Um, and yeah, so is, is, uh, there's a quotation from the Brahma Samhita, um, which is explaining, there's many, so there's, there's all kinds of, you know, very nice details in the Brahma Samhita about the spiritual world, about Goloka Vrindavan. So much of the information that we have about Goloka Vrindavan is actually from the Brahma Samhita. Um, which obviously Chaitanya Mahaprabhu kindly gave us this scripture, which was originally lost, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu found the Brahma Samhita and he gave it to us. 
So in, in that scripture, it explains that the Lord is simultaneously always present in Goloka Vrindavan, but at the same time, he's also um, the Brahman and the Paramatma through his, through his energy, through the spiritual energy. Um, so he is present, he is present everywhere at once, simultaneously. So then um, Shri Prabhupada in the lecture explains this. So he gives a nice example. Although he is living in his abode, Goloka Vrindavan, he is everywhere. He is everywhere. Just like the same example can be used, that sun is 90 million miles or something like that away from us, but it is, it is within your room. Otherwise, how you say, oh, sunlight is here. So if sun can penetrate within your room, cannot Krishna penetrate within your heart and room in every corner? He is so useless. He is everywhere, but you have to realize how he is everywhere. So it's, it's, you know, it's a lovely example that Sri Prabhupada gives many times in his, in his classes that we know and we know and scientists know as well that the sun is about 93 million miles away from the earth. The average, average distance is about 93 million miles. So Sri Prabhupada is saying, you know, it's, it's at such an incredible distance, but at the same time, through its energy, through the sunlight, it, is still, it can still be present in our room. So Sri Prabhupada is saying in the same way, you know, the spiritual world is, is, is much, much, much further than the sun, you know, from us. You know, it's a huge, unimaginable distance away from us. So Krishna is there all the time, but at the same time, he is, he is right with us at all times. As the, you know, as the energy which pervades the entire universe and also as the Paramatma, the super soul within, within our hearts and within every atom. So Sri Prabhupada continues in the purple. No one can reach the spiritual sky, Vaikuntha, or enter into the Lord's eternal abode, Goloka Vrindavan, without the proper understanding of Krishna and his plenary expansion, Vishnu. Therefore, a person working in Krishna consciousness is the perfect yogi, because his mind is always absorbed in Krishna's activities. So we were talking about... Um, you know, Sri Prabhupada is talking about, you know, the advanced yogi who's perfect in understanding of Krishna. And now he's saying, he's explaining a bit more exactly why, you know, they are a perfect yogi, because their mind are always absorbed in Krishna's activities. Um, because obviously, <clears throat> you know, the, the, um, the verse itself that we're looking at today is, it mentions about the mind, body and senses. So here it just mentions the mind, but obviously we can extend it to the body and senses because we know the devotee, you know, their mind is always absorbing Krishna. And then also their senses are always engaged in Krishna's service. And because they're serving, that means their actions as well. So their body is also engaged for Krishna as well. So mind, body and senses are all absorbing Krishna. So that is, that is considered the perfect yogi. Okay, um, yeah, could we have another volunteer, please, to read this paragraph? Shall I read, Prabhuji? Yes, please. Thank you. Nobody is better meditator than these boys. They are simply concentrating on Krishna. Their whole business is Krishna. They are working in the garden, digging the earth. Oh, there will be nice rose we shall offer to Krishna. Meditation. Practical meditation, I shall grow rose and it will be offered to Krishna. Even in the digging, there is meditation, you see. They are preparing nice food stuff. Oh, it will be eaten by Krishna. So in cooking, there is meditation, you see. And what to speak of chanting and dancing. So they are meditating 24 hours in Krishna, perfect yogi. Thank you, Matri. Okay, so... Yes, yeah, so Sri Prabhupada is making a point here that meditation, you know, we've covered before that meditation is not simply just sitting in a solitary place. Um, I mean, obviously, we've heard many descriptions about that and how we should meditate. 
but then obviously we also hear that in this day in this day and age of kali yuga is you know it's very difficult to to do these kind of meditations at least for an extended period of time regularly you know it's very difficult you know it's very rare for someone to be able to, be able to do this on a daily basis so um, fortunately we don't need to you know sure Prabhupada is talking about here about practical meditation so you know being absorbed in service for Krishna is meditation and there's a few examples here about you know doing some gardening and then offering the results to Krishna so the flowers the petals the roses whatever it might be offering that to Krishna then he's talking about preparing food to be offered uh, to Krishna and then he's talking about you know chanting and dancing so all these things the devotees are engaged in so because they are meditating in Krishna in this way in this practical meditation then again they're described as the perfect yogi so this is obviously Sri Prabhupada here just giving a couple of examples you know he's just talking about gardening cooking chanting dancing so these are just a few, but obviously we know there are so many different activities, so many different ways that we can engage ourselves in Krishna service according to our nature, according to our, our God-given skills and abilities. You know, we can, we can engage in Krishna service in that way. So the final paragraph or final section from the purple, Sri Prabhupada says, in the Vedas also, Tvetashvata Upanishad, 3.8. We learn Dham Eva Viditvati Mrityumeti. One can overcome the path of birth and death only by understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. In other words, perfection of the yoga system is the attainment of freedom from material existence and not some magical jugglery or gymnastic feats to befool innocent people. So here again, Sri Prabhupada is concluding that the perfection of yoga is to attain freedom from material existence and instead, you know, replacing it with spiritual existence, you know, being absorbed in Krishna. So just like, just like we have, you know, some weighing scales. So say, for example, you know, we have sort of material activities on the one side and so material activities and desires in one side and on the other side it's spiritual but if we so you know as a material fully materially conditioned soul obviously we only have just it's just fully one-sided you know it's just we only have material desires material activities that we're absorbed in so we can you know if we manage to you know get rid of those material desires um, become free from those and obviously you know the scale will just become level but then you know we also have to replace it with something on the other side on the spiritual side we need to develop spiritual desires um, and engage in spiritual activity so it's a it's not just as we said before it's not just reducing to void reducing to zero but it's then you know what's what's on the positive side you know so and here Sri Prabhupada is saying at the end that, you know, yoga, uh, he mentions, again, he mentions this point in so many lectures that yoga is not just, you know, going to the yoga center, going to the yoga studio, just doing a bit of gymnastics and then going home, going home and then continuing to engage in nonsensical material activities. He said, this is not really yoga. And he's, then he said, he said, even you can see um, Sri Prabhupada said, I've seen myself that most of the most of these so-called meditators, they're going to these places um, to do meditation, but they're simply sleeping. He said, I've seen that actually most of them are just sleeping. Um, and yeah, and there was actually, yeah, there was one actually, one class from Sri Prabhupada, again, where basically he was asked a question by I, I don't know I think it was some reporter or something that there was they were they had noticed actually that a lot of the devotees during their so-called you know meditation their japa meditation time they had noticed that a lot of the devotees were sleeping so again Sri Prabhupada kind of you know made a joke about it that they 
that they're doing meditation by lying down, he said. So um, obviously at that time, he was just making a joke about it. But it's true that if a lot of times, you know, we can just feel very sleepy and not actually be that focused on what is the actual goal of this yoga that I'm doing. And it's, and the last few words, he says, it's not to befool innocent people. So this is a point that he mentions about, you know, if we want something cheap, then there are so many cheaters to cheat us. Um, there's so many people out there who will take our money and cheat us by giving us something cheap and quick. Um, but that is just cheating the innocent people who don't know any better. The actual perfection of yoga is the actual substance, you know, which is to actually focus on Krishna. Um, so, okay, so I just wanted to add one more thing, um, which will basically a bit, be a bit more practical of how we can actually apply this in our lives. So I wanted to do that by giving an example from Srimad Bhagavatam of Akrura. Um, Akrura, when he, he is sent by Kamsa to go and fetch Krishna and Balaram, so he, he eventually arrives in Vrindavan. And, you know, there's some, there's some beautiful verses describing how he is focused on Krishna, totally absorbed and meditating on Krishna. So I just wanted to end with that, and then we can open it up to any questions and comments. Um, on today's verse. So this is from, um, so we're looking at Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 38. So I've just got three verses um, which really explain this in a, in a very beautiful way. So the first verse is text 25. So in the coward pasture, Akrura saw the footprints of those feet whose pure dust the rulers of all the planets in the universe hold in their crowns. Those footprints of the Lord distinguished by such marks as the lotus, barley corn, and elephant goad made the ground wonderfully beautiful. So this is the first thing that Akrura sees when he enters, you know, the coward pastures of Vrindavan, when he enters rural Vrindavan, he first notices the footprints of the Lord. And how does he understand that these are the footprints of Krishna as opposed to anyone else? Because obviously we know that Krishna has a series of certain markings on his feet, which distinguish his, his uh, footprints from anyone else. So that is how, you know, that is how he understood that these are actually Krishna's footprints. And it's said that, those who, you know, those pre devotees, those advanced devotees who, actually, who can actually see Vrindavan as, as, they, as it really is, you know, just like the inter, eternal residence in Vrindavan, they can, they can see these footprints at, all the time. Because actually, it's described that once, you know, Krishna's footprints have been made, they're, always, they're there all the time, they're there eternally. Um, so it's just that as materially conditioned souls, we cannot see them when we, when we visit Vrindavan. But those who have spiritual vision, they can see that actually, yeah, Vrindavan is, is covered all over by these footprints. And the devotees, just by seeing these footprints, um, are filled with ecstasy, as we'll see in the next verse. Increasingly agitated by ecstasy, but seeing the Lord's footprints, his bodily hair standing on end because of his pure love, and his eyes filled with tears, Akrura jumped down from his chariot and began rolling about among those footprints, explain, exclaiming, ah, this is the dust from my master's feet. So as I said, those, you know, those pure devotees who see these footprints immediately, because it reminds them of Krishna, immediately they're full of spiritual ecstasy, they're full of bliss um, due to their pure love for Krishna. And then as just as we hear that the first thing we do when we when we come to the dust of Vrindavan is that you know we should roll about in the dust and, and through that get that mercy, that very special mercy. So that, that's exactly, you know, setting the example for us, that's exactly what Kuru did. And then so this is the verse that I want to focus on. So the very goal of life 
for all embodied beings is this ecstasy which a Kuru experienced when, upon receiving Kamsa's order, he put aside all pride, fear, lamentation, and absorbed himself in seeing, hearing, and describing the things that reminded him of Lord Krishna. So this is um, basically something we can also put in, put in practice in our own lives, that, you know, just as Akrura, he gave up pride, fear, and lamentation um, in order to, you know, fully absorb himself in Krishna, in simply seeing, hearing, and describing things that remind him of Krishna. In the same way, if we want to be, you know, totally absorbed in Krishna one day, then also we need to give up these three things, this, this pride, fear, and lamentation. And instead, you know, fully absorb ourselves, you know, just as today's verse talks about mind, body, and senses, you know, fully absorb our mind, body, and senses in those things that remind us of Lord Krishna. So when it says those things that remind us of Lord Krishna, that, that is those things um, in particular that remind us, not anybody else, but us about Krishna, because obviously we're all different. We all have different natures. And there's set, there will always be certain things that we are sort of naturally more drawn to, naturally more attracted to. So we should uh, focus on those particular things. So whatever we find, oh, this reminds me of Krishna more than this, then yeah, focus on that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Focusing on those things that remind us individually um, of Krishna. So, you know, it may be some people, uh, for some people, it may be Kirtan. It may be, you know, listening to Kirtan or participating in Kirtan or even leading Kirtan. Or, you know, it could be hearing some classes, some lectures from Shri Prabhupada and the other Acharyas or Shri Prabhupada's disciples or, you know, other great devotees. Or, yeah, it could be dancing. It could be, it could even be eating prashadam. You know, maybe, maybe eating prashadam for us or honoring prashadam for us is the, is the easiest way for us to remember Krishna. So, yeah, we can do that, um, obviously within reason, uh, within limits, but yeah, we can focus on eating prashada. Or, um, yeah, so basically, that, again, that's just a few, few examples. Um, I'm sure we can think of other examples uh, um, of particular things that remind us most of, of, of Lord Krishna. But if we can, you know, we can, we can, Think about Krishna through those activities sometimes. But again, if we want to be totally absorbed in Krishna all the time, then as I said, we have to give up these three things. So in, in the purport to this verse, Srila Prabhupada actually gives the explanation of Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur of how Akura gave up these three things. So we'll just look at that now. So um, According to Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, Akrura gave up fear by openly demonstrating his devotion for Krishna, despite the risk of punishment by Kamsa. He gave up his pride by worshipping the simple villagers of Vrindavan, despite his aristocratic position. And he also gave up lamentation for his house, wife and family, even though he knew that you know, they would be in danger from Kamsa. So he's basically saying that, you know, openly, openly showing our devotion to Krishna, openly worshipping Krishna. Obviously, here it's an extreme example of punishment by Kamsa. But we can, you know, in our own lives, we may have sort of uh, lesser obstacles, lesser um, difficult situations that we come across, which may put us into a fearful position. But if we, can, if we can try to continue practicing devotional service, despite those fearful situations, um, then that, is, that, that will help us to give up that fear. Because we've continued, the more we become absorbed in Krishna, um, who, is, who is, is described, he strikes fear uh, in the heart of fear personified. 
So if we if we engage our, sorry, if we absorb ourselves in Krishna, then over time through through his mercy, we can give up that fear. Then Akura gave up his pride. You know, he's in a he's in a high position, but he gives he gives that all up by simply worshipping, you know, those who are, you know, the simple cowherd folk of Vrindavan, you know, the village of Vrindavan. From a material from a material point of view, they are they seem much less advanced, you know, very simple. But Akura understood that. Spiritually, they have a far, far more elevated position. So he was actually worshipping them. He was actually offering his obeisance to, to them, offering all respects to them. And in that way, also, we can, by worshipping the devotees, um, offering our respects and obeisances to the devotees and serving the devotees, we can give up that pride. And then finally, you know, we are, as we heard earlier, about being filled with anxiety for those, those things that we have in our, in our material lives. We're full of anxiety and we are lamenting that, oh, I might, well, I might lose this or I might lose that. And then if we do actually lose it, then we will even you know, lament even more. So there's that aspect of lamentation for those things that we have now but we know that we're going to lose them. So, you know, we can, you know, uh, Akura, he is, he's fully understanding spiritual knowledge. You know, he has full knowledge about spiritual, uh, about, you know, all the scriptures and he has full understanding of Krishna. Um, you know, so he understands the reality of the situation. Um, so he's kind of, yeah, equipoise. That's what I was looking for. He's he's equipoised um, in in so-called bad situations and good situations. Look, just like Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita about um, the happiness and distress that we experience in the material world is just like the um, winter and summer seasons, which appear and then disappear. So in the same way, this material happiness and, and unhappiness they appear and disappear. So if we understand this and realize it, then we won't we won't lament for those for those things because we understand. Okay, they're with us for a certain time, and then they will go. And that's and that's not to say that we we treat all those things callously. Um, we engage the material possessions in Krishna's service, and our, we try and. Um, yeah, help help our loved ones, our friends and family on their journey to Krishna and if possible engage them in service as well. So understand I have these certain things for a little while as a temporary caretaker. So I look after them, but I don't lament when I lose them um, because they belong to Krishna ultimately. They don't belong to me. So I think Probably for most of us, this last one is the hardest one to put into practice um, because, you know, attachment, we, so many attachments we have in this material world, which is, which are the things which strongly bind us to the material world. So obviously, um, you know, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. Um, I'm definitely not on, on that position um, at the moment, but yeah, at least we are, at least we know um, that that is what we're aiming towards, um, to be in that sort of equipoise position where we don't lament um, when things really go down and we don't feel overjoyed uh, when things seem to be going up um, from, a, from a material point of view. Um, so actually, yeah. <clears throat> actually, this, uh, sorry, this last slide, I, I actually just, um, added last minute, so apologies, it's unfinished. Um, I think I did kind of mention in speaking the third section. Um, so basically, this is just a summary. So I want to end with this slide. It's a summary of what I just mentioned. Uh, we know we know this word anartha. So anarthas are those unwanted things, those unwanted qualities in our lives which we're trying to get rid of. 
So here, obviously, I've listed the three, fear, pride, lamentation. And then what is the quality that we need to overcome this? So it's kind of almost like the opposite, if you like. Um, so having that, that strength, you know, just like Akura has spiritual strength that even though there was such opposition, there would be such opposition from Kamsa if, if Kamsa found out, but still he was, he was fearlessly and openly still um, displaying his devotion to Krishna. So we need that spiritual strength as well. So how do we do that? So one of the main things is obviously one of the most powerful things is to associate with devotees who are fixed in their spiritual practice, fixed in their sadhana. Um, because obviously those who are really fixed, that means they have that spiritual strength. If they didn't have spiritual strength, um, then they wouldn't be able to be fixed because they would still be so much swayed and tempted by material things. So um, just like we hear, you know, the association of the spiritual master and the, the devotees is like a touchstone and whatever comes in contact, you know, whatever comes in contact with the touchstone, um, you know, becomes, becomes affected. So in the same way, if we become, uh, sorry, if we come in touch with those devotees, like a, because they're like a touchstone, then we will also uh, become influenced and some of those qualities will rub off on us as well. So it's very important. One of the most important things is association. Um, and then just another little practical thing I wanted to add is, okay, we need spiritual strength. What is the original source of spiritual strength? You know, where does it come from? You know, we have that, um, sorry, a, a very bad joke, but obviously, you know, we have that shower gel original source. So, you know, if there was a spiritual strength variety of original source, um, you know, then where would this come from? You know, this, sorry, that was, I know that was a terrible joke. Um, so anyway, the source of spiritual strength is Nityananda Prabhu, it's Lord Balaram. Um, as we know, Nityananda Prabhu and Lord Balaram are, the, are one and the same. They are the same personality. And we understand from the scriptures that they are the source of spiritual strength. And by extension, the spiritual master. Because uh, Lord Nityananda, Lord Balaram, they are the source of Guru Tattva. And uh, in simple terms, it basically means that um, all bona fide spiritual masters, bona fide gurus, are representatives of Nityananda Prabhu. So either directly through Nityananda Prabhu or the spiritual master, um, we can pray to them for spiritual strength because, as I said, they are the source of that spiritual strength. Then um, pride. Obviously, the other side of pride is humility. Again, this is one of the things we hear, hear so much about in Krishna consciousness. It's vital to advance in Krishna consciousness. So how do we do this? Well, we need to put aside all external facades, um, all these um, masks that we wear, all these things that we hide behind. Um, we have to put, put aside all those things and honestly just accept, you know, our fallen position, our insufficiencies that we have as a conditioned soul in this world. Just coming before Krishna, um, and just being completely open and honest about our position. That's the first thing we need to do. That's how we, how we, um, how we start that process. And then um, just as I mentioned here, uh, that Akura was worshiping the villagers of Vrindavan. So in the same way, you know, we also have to serve the devotees. You know, worshiping, for us, worshiping the devotees doesn't just mean just sort of just worshiping from afar, but what does what does what do we do practically? Is is perform practical service for the devotees, um, whether that's in the temple or or at a um, a sangha group or different or whatever kind of event anywhere you know, whatever opportunity, whether even if it's online, whatever opportunity we have to perform some service for devotees, that will. Um, yeah, that will help us to develop humility. 
And one thing, yeah, one thing I forgot to put on this list is, which is very practical and very powerful, is that if we can do some service where we know that we won't, where no one will find out, if we can do some service in secret where we know we're not going to get any credit for it, then that is especially powerful. You know, so if you ever, if you're ever in a position where you just see um, somewhere where there's like an opportunity for some devotional service to be done, um, where there's no one to watch you, then that is exceptionally powerful to develop that humility. And also Krishna will see that um, because this whole, through this entire process of trying to develop these qualities, Krishna, if we're putting the endeavor, Krishna is helping us as well through his mercy. So if Krishna sees that we're not just doing service, we can do service for, for different motives. We can do service when people are looking, when we have an audience, and Krishna understands that, and he, he reciprocates accordingly. But if we are serving when we don't have an audience, then he reciprocates in a different way. So just like they say, um, we can know, you know, what we what are we really like when what when sorry no, let me start again what we do when no one is looking is you know is a sort of more accurate indicator of, of our of you know the qualities that we have or what we're actually like um, we can do so many things when people are looking but when there's no one to tell us um, that you should do this you should do that are we actually still doing those things um, are we still just by our own volition, we're still doing those devotional activities because we want to do it, not just because there's someone there um, watching us and we want to make a good impression or there's someone telling us to do it, um, to do this for Krishna. But if we actually want to do it ourselves for Krishna, it's, it's you know, there's a different, uh, it's very different there. So as I said, I, I didn't manage to finish this, this table for the session but you know i mentioned um about how how we can overcome this this lamentation so i will end there um so i know it's been a bit long a lot of talking from me um okay so are there any questions any comments any realizations or if you have any other suggestions um, I've, actually, yeah, I would be very interested to hear, and I would appreciate if you have any other suggestions how we can overcome uh, material fear, pride, and lamentation. Um, so, yeah, if anyone has any examples of that, I'd be happy to hear. And also, if you'd like to share what reminds you, what particular things remind you of Krishna. So, yeah, is there anything anyone would like to share? Hare well, Prabhu, this is Chandra Chaitanya. How are you? Hare Krishna Prabhu, I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Very Enjoying much. Session. Very nice to see you doing a session like this. We want to see you regularly. And lovely slides, very clear, very graphic. Uh, you are an artist, so you are putting your uh, talents to the right use. Yes, keep it up, please. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your blessings, Prabhu. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, would anyone else, oh, sorry, got a question? How can anyone in the material world, even those in authority, know anything about the spiritual world except what is written about it in the scriptures? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. So, you know, we're, we're, we're approaching the authorities. So, you know, if it's, um, Essentially, we're talking about we're talking about pure devotees, you know, devotees who are on the, on on such a high level. For example, Sri Prabhupada is is our best example that they are they, they are not someone in the material world or someone from the material world. They are so, they are they are um, they are devotees who have come directly from the spiritual world down to the material down to the material world. They don't actually have any place here in the material world. Um, they belong in the, in the spiritual world, but they, they come here for our benefit. Um, so, you know, these are fully spiritual personalities. So what, what they say, what they say about the spiritual world, 
they're saying from practical knowledge, from first-hand knowledge, first-hand experience, this is what the spiritual world is actually like because they know they're from there. Um, just as we know, um, Shura Prabhupada was a resident of Vrindavan, uh, you know, whether in the spiritual world or, or in India, he is always a resident of Vrindavan. He was always in Vrindavan. So because he is also, you know, an associate of Krishna, then he knows. So we can take what he says as, you know, as, as that authority. We can, we can have faith in his word. We can have faith that, that everything, everything Shura Prabhupada says, um, we can have faith in that because he is from the spiritual world. And, you know, when you hear him in his classes, when you hear um, really advanced devotees you can you can hear the difference you know you can you can you can observe the difference when they're speaking there is there's that special um there's that special conviction in their voice when they speak about it when you when you hear them you just know this is not just someone speaking theoretically but they don't actually know anything um from a practical point of view no you, you have that faith that actually this person they know what, what they're talking about you know, if you if you listen attentively, then you will notice the difference. Um, so, for example, I remember um, another brilliant example is you know obviously Pankaj Jangri Prabhu and Chidani Vas Prabhu. Um, obviously, Pankaj Jangri Prabhu is you know as we all know he's no longer with us um, physically in the material world, but at least I can remember from. The last time he was at the manor and the hearing the classes that he gave, and since then hearing his classes um, on online as well, um, I remember <clears throat> every single time I heard from him, I'd have that distinct feeling that this that he's you know for example he's describing Vrindavan he's describing the spiritual world I have this distinct feeling that he knows exactly what he's talking about he's talking from experience and just the the way, the taste he has for it, the enthusiasm he has for it, the obvious devotion he has, and the details that he that he describes, which, which you know, you wouldn't know unless you're actually from that place. So then, I just found I just found it so incredible that yeah, definitely, I have no doubt that this personality has come from the spiritual world. And you know, we 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 know that there's the famous. Um, quote or famous saying about uh, Panga Jangri Prabhu and Janani Vas Prabhu that they actually came directly from Vaikuntha to teach to teach this movement to teach ISKCON about deity worship so you know we understand that they are also from the spiritual world so I guess yeah from if we if we um, I was thinking I don't know if it's actually implied in this question but I was just thinking from, based on this question, that we may not have faith in certain people, certain authorities, that we don't have that full faith, that we're not really sure, are they actually pure devotees? Are they actually really advanced devotees? Do they actually uh, know what they're talking about? Are they actually realized? We may not have so much faith, um, but there are so many, like I said, there's so many different authorities we can approach that we, we can have that faith in, like Sri Prabhupada. And ultimately, those personalities like Shri Prabhupada, they are not saying anything. They are representatives of Krishna because they are not saying anything different than, than what Krishna would say. There's, they're teaching exactly the same thing that Krishna would say and, and exactly what is written in the scriptures. But yeah, if we don't have, if we don't, haven't developed any faith yet in actual devotees physically, then yeah, we can start with the scriptures, which have been written by, you know, such incredible devotees like the six Goswamis that we can, you know, we can easily have, have, have faith in, in personalities like that. I don't think anyone will have any doubts in the six Goswamis that, you know, what they are saying is, can be taken as authoritative. So, uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, any more, any more additions, any comments or corrections, any reflections? Nice to uh, always nice to make this more interactive. Yeah. 
um, you know, I guess it's I guess it's uh, nine o'clock anyway. So yeah, if, if no one has anything else to add, um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and and hearing um, from well, hearing from me, but also hearing about Bhagavad Gita, hearing from the words of Krishna, hearing from Sri Prabhupada. Um, it's, it's, so, it's always so wonderful, so purifying for us to hear these words. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's all about hearing and chanting, hearing and chanting. So this is the, the, first, the first steps um, in devotional services, Shravanam Kirtanam. These are the primary activities is hearing and chanting. So we're doing, all of us here, by being present in these sessions, are doing just that. So yeah, so we'll not, we'll have another wonderful session from a from another wonderful. So I'm not saying I'm wonderful, but we will have a wonderful devotee um, who will give, I'm sure, an even better session tomorrow. So okay, Hare Krishna, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Vancha kalpa etarubhyascha kripa Anantakoti vrindaki jay. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna